by the Dr. Shroff Charity Eye Hospital. I am Dr. Shelja Tibriwal, and along with Ms. Riya Ratna and Dr. Arpan Gandhi, we would be moderating this session. So as we all know that this coronavirus has kind of created havoc in our lives, but being an infectious disease, we know that some cure is on, on the way and there is some kind of relief. However, genetic disorders have been around for ages and they are here to stay. stay. So it is high time that we all uh, integrate and kind of pay more heed to them. Around 50% of our uh, patients in the clinic are actually directly related to genetics and inheritable disorders. However, often we do not, uh, we neglect them and do not take the further course in their management. So this webinar is our attempt to bring together specialists from the field of genetics as well as ophthalmology to educate all of us more on ocular genetics and the associated disorders. So without further delay, I would like to introduce our amazing panelists and speakers each of them is a stalwart in, in their own field. And therefore, we are so grateful to, for them to be a part of this webinar today. In no particular order, I would like to introduce Dr. Ken Mishra first. I know him personally as an amazing clinician with a sharp eye and with attention to detail. He would pick up tiniest of details in the patients. He's uh, a person who I um, idealize because he has integrated genetics and ophthalmology so well, which you can see in his clinic in day-to-day -day practice, he helps the patients along with it. He's the professor of ophthalmology and the chief of the pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus unit at the UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. He's also the medical director of the Digital Health UPMC, uh, UPMC Children's Vice Chair. I would not go into run into because it really does not need an introduction to this audience. I'm so grateful, sir, to have you today. Uh, next, uh, I would like to introduce Hannah. Now, Hannah Skanga, so she's the American Board uh, Certified Genetic Counselor. The special part about her is she specialized in ophthalmic genetics due to her close relationship and work with Dr. Ken in his clinics, which is a very rare species to find. And uh, she has helped uh, Dr. Shroff Charity Hospital through a genetic educators clinic earlier, uh, where she, they, she had trained uh, uh, optometrists for pedigree charting. And that is how we could do pedigree charting and identify inheritance patterns even before Ria joined us in our clinic. Um, next, I would like to introduce a man who actually requires no introduction in the field of genetics in India. So Dr. I.C. Verma, needs no introduction. He is the founder of the Institute of Medical Genetics and Genomics at Sir Gangaram Hospital. Uh, he is now an, currently an advisor to them. He was early a professor of pediatrics and genetics at Ames. There is no uh, talk about genetics in India without mentioning his name. Uh, he has several awards and honors to him, even a mention in Limca Book of Records. Yet, when I asked him for this webinar, he was just a WhatsApp away and he uh, gracefully agreed for it. So I'm so delighted and so thankful that he's here today. Uh, next, I would like to introduce Rhea. So she's a co-moderator for the session today. She's our genetic counselor since 2018. So very fresh on the block. But she's trained, if you can see her training, she's trained in the lab work, but uh, deep down she wanted to be with, uh, with the patients and help them throughout their lives. And that is why she chose to be a genetic counselor. We are so lucky to have her. She's full of energy and always running, uh, bubbling with ideas. Uh, with that, I would like to ask Ria to introduce the rest of the speakers and the panelists. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shaija, for the kind introduction. Um, I would just introduce Dr. Shaija Tibrival. She's a pediatric ophthalmologist. Uh, seven years and also my mentor at work from the day she interviewed me for my position at the hospital till day she exudes a lot of energy and uh, uh, growth in the field of ocular genetics and she's always willing to go the extra mile to support families thank you dr shaija Next, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Annie Q. Hassan. Dr. Annie is currently the HOD of Department of Genetics and Molecular Medicine at Kamineni Hospital in Hyderabad. Her greatest accomplishments include the commencing of the genetic counseling course and board in India, to name just one. I speak for all genetic counselors in India when I say she has been our guide through our training and beyond. Uh, she is always happy to get over the phone and discuss innovative ideas to expand genetics in any way. Thank you, ma'am, for agreeing to be with us today. Next, I would like to introduce uh, our esteemed panelist, uh, Dr. Sam Balu, who is the Assistant Lab Director with European Clinical Genetics India and currently situated in Bangalore. Dr. Sam has been widely invested 
interested in the inception of PGS and PGD technologies in India. From the beginning of his association with us, he has been very supportive of introducing genetic testing at our hospital. And his skill and trust in patient welfare reflects greatly in his approachability. Thank you for joining us, uh, Dr. Sam. And uh, lastly, I would like to introduce Dr. Arpan Gandhi. He is the head of ocular pathology and lab services at Shroff Hospitals and Secondary Center Labs. He has vast experience of over 20 years in the field of ocular pathology. He works very closely with the genetics team at SCH and is currently helping us create our own biobank for unique heritable disorders in a very large capacity. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Gandhi. Over to you now. Uh, thank you, uh, Ria, and I'm honored and privileged to introduce my friend, Dr. Arka. He, he is uh, a very well-known research scientist in ocular genetics. He heads the GROW Research Lab at Narayan Netrayan in Bangalore and has achieved his doctoral and postdoctoral training from India as well as abroad, Singapore and the United States. He has special interest in gene therapy and has several patents, awards and publications. And the best thing about him, apart from what all I said, he's very approachable and always ready to help you. So, welcome, Dr. Arka. I would now welcome all the audience and would like Dr. Shelja to please commence the session. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for the introductions. Before I start with the session, I would like to thank some of the people who are eminent people who are there in an audience today. I can see Dr. Gyan Prakash from NEI. He's the Associate Director at the International Programs of Office of Global Health. He is one of our supporters and has been pushing us for towards genetic uh, growth of genetics in our hospital. He also sponsored my training for uh, genetics in uh, year through NEI. Dr. Takeshi Wata, I'm so glad that he's there in our um, uh, uh, audience today. He is the director of NISO Tokyo Medical Center. I can also see Dr. Ratnapuri here. Thank you, ma'am, for joining here. She's an uh, amazing geneticist again at uh, Gangaram Hospital. So with that, I would like to start the session today. Before starting the session, I want uh, the audience to answer some poll questions. This is for us to know you better. So now you could see those poll questions. They are um, very easy, simple questions that you should answer so that we know what uh, kind of audience there is and uh, accordingly um, structure our discussions. So what is the location from where you are attending this session? What is your professional background? And in your practice, how often do you come across heritable disorders or disorders with genetic etiology? So we got mostly from India, America and Asia. Uh, most of them are ophthalmologists, but there are geneticists and uh, genetic counselors equally. And lab personals and clinical clinicians other than ophthalmologists are also there, which is very good. So most of them, more than 50% of the times they saw their, um, they see genetic disorders. So that's a very good uh, start. With that, I would like to invite Dr. Ken Nishil for his first talk. Dr. Ken, could you please start sharing your slides? He would be talking about how to uh, integrate the genetic, uh, the concept of genetics in clinics, which is uh, his forte, actually. Thank you so much, uh, Shelja, for uh, inviting me to speak uh, on this webinar. Um, I, I hope you can you can hear me. Um, yes, sir, loud and clear. Sure. So uh, what I want to point out is that when people worry about or think about genetics, um, I, I was not trained as a geneticist, but I had an interest in trying to figure out why I was seeing what I was seeing. And I, what I want to show you is a, a few lessons that I've learned as I've incorporated more and more genetics uh, into the clinic. So the first lesson is this here. Here's a child. If you look, the teeth don't quite look right. She's got a, a face where the cheekbones are a little bit flat. And if you look at her belly button, it's a, what we call an outie. There's a little bit of a uh, um, uh, an outpouching of the umbilical uh, 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 area. And if you look at her eyes, she has no, she's had no surgery and she has this very large hypoplastic iris with a large pupil, uh, correctopia. And, and this child has Axenfeld Rieger syndrome. And we know that the syndrome can be caused by Foxy1 or Pitex2. You know, to a large extent, the gene is not the important thing, it's the clinical diagnosis. And the first question you have to ask is, why does this child look so different from her mother or her father? 
as it was in this case. Sometimes a child may look like one of the parents, but the, if you don't ask the question, you don't start to think about whether there could be an underlying uh, genetic cause. Here's another child, uh, this time with, uh, again, axenfeld rieger um, syndrome. Again, the classical changes you can see in the, uh, in the angle with the Axenfeld uh, uh, anomaly. But again, the question that you have to ask is, what is going on here? And in this child, what was going on was compared to her siblings, she was short. So if you have a, sh a child who's short with axenfeld rieger changes in the eyes, you, you again start to think about whether this could be PITX2 because PITX2 has been reported as causing growth deficiency. There have been some papers with FOXY1 causing that as well, but again, you have to ask the question, why is this child who has a genetic condition in her eye um, short compared to her other siblings? Here's another child. If you look at the cornea, the cornea is flat. This is cornea plana. And these are the typical changes you see in cornea plana with pupillary rough. You can see iridocorneal adhesions as well. And they get this sort of nebulous change in the middle of the stroma. But when you see this, don't just look at the eye. If you start to look at this child, you can see that he has syndactyly of the third, uh, fourth and fifth digits. The teeth are not right. And this is a condition called oculo Entomedical syndrome. And my point is, you're eye doctors, we're ophthalmologists, but look at the child as a whole and just say, look at the hand, see what's going on. Look at the teeth. These are simple things that we can do without going outside our comfort zone. But the more you do it, the more comfortable you get. And this is due to mutations in GJA1. Um, Here's two children I'm going to show you. This is no drops in the eyes, and yet the pupils look dilated, and it's because the pupil sphincter is missing. Here's another child with the same condition. When you see this, you have to take a family history, and if you take a family history in both these children, there's a history of unusual um, premature death around the age of 30 or 40, and a history of uh, arterial dissection. And this is due to a condition called ACTA2, which is a problem with smooth muscle. So the first lesson is gain some confidence by examining hands, looking at the teeth, and asking the question, why? Why is this child who has an, a genetic condition of the eye different to the rest of her family or his family? Observation. This is a video courtesy of one of my colleagues uh, from London, Isabel Russell Eggett. I don't know if you saw that, but what you see here, I'm going to slow it down, is a fluttering of the iris. And this is in an older person, but you can see this in children, in infants as well. And what it is a sign of is subluxated lenses. And I want to then discuss this child, five month old, who presented for an ophthalm exam. They thought he had craniosynostosis, he didn't. But what I noticed at eight months of age was iridodenesis prior to dilation. Always look at children's eyes, look at how the eye moves, look at what's happening to the iris. And he did in fact, and this is the best picture we could get from him, have lenses that were dislocated up and out. Now we know that classically we say that Marfan syndrome or fibrillin gene mutations give you dislocations like this. But in this case, not only did he have dislocations, but his cornea was flat. And we know from the Australian registry studies that if you have a relatively flat cornea, it doesn't have to be cornea plana, but relatively flat with lens dislocation, that that is a fibrillin gene mutation till proven otherwise. In this child, if you looked at the family history, again, there's this story of vertebral artery dissection. So a connective tissue disorder. And when he had his cardiology evaluation, he had a mildly dilated aortic root, a tricuspid valve regurgitation. This is all fitting with Marfan syndrome. But when we did the FBN1 gene sequencing, 
no mutation was detected. Now, just stop there for a minute. The clinical diagnosis in my mind was definitely Marfan syndrome. So I asked Hannah, I said, Hannah, what's going on? And she said, well, when you do sequencing with the new, new techniques that we have, it's like speed reading. So if you miss a sentence, the paragraph can still make sense. So we then did what we call deletion duplication, and we found that there was a deletion in the gene, right? So we have to understand that the tests that we do are not more important than the clinical diagnosis that we make. So lesson number two, the clinical diagnosis, when you are very sure of it, trumps everything. Taking a family pedigree is very important, and genetic testing is not absolute or complete necessarily. So you have to ask the question, how was the test done? And it's possible that we don't have the ability to do the testing to the level that we want to do. So I want to talk about familial exudative vitreoretinopathy. And I hope you get the idea that what I'm trying to show you is that it's not just the front of the eye. It's not just the back of the eye. This is an attitude to how you look at your patients. You look at your patients as a doctor and as an eye specialist. And when you do that, you start to see patterns. Now, we all know what familial exudative vitreoretinopathy looks like. We know that these are the causes. I don't want you to concentrate on that because you may not have access to testing for these. But what I want you to notice is that if you read the literature, there are patterns that develop that bilateral symmetrical retinopathy tends to be seen in these mutations and the relatively milder but broader spectrum tend to be seen in this. But there's something even more important. If you look at this child and you look at the straightening of the vessels and you can see the avascular zone, and here's another child with what we used to call falciform ligaments, and you see another child with the exudate, all of these children had mutations in LRP5, and actually one of them is an adult. But what we know about LRP5 is this. We know that in LRP5, you can have low bone mass density. It can also be uh, responsible for this condition called OPS. But just think about it. If you have somebody who has FEVR, you've made the clinical diagnosis, but you can't do genetic testing, you can do a cheap DEXA scan for bone density. And if the DEXA scan shows that for age, the bone density is low, what you've done is you've treated this patient and perhaps sus be suspicious that they may have an LRP5 mutation. So lesson number three is use the literature to derive clinical pearls that will help you assess the genotype without necessarily doing molecular testing if it's not immediately at hand. And then the last lesson is that when you see an eye sign, like this is aniridia, a spontaneous uh, case, so no family history, always remember to check other parts of the body. And in this case, this is taken from Kansky's book. This is a child with Wilms tumor and aniridia. So when you look at the eye, think about what you can do, even if you don't have genetic testing, to save that child's life. Lesson number four, you can save lives and change things for your patients. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Dr. Ken. Uh, your talks are always so mesmerizing and just bound us, bind us to the screen. Uh, you have given so many amazing pearls to us. Uh, I would like for, to ask you for, and the other panelists as well, is uh, while you're examining in the clinic any child, what are the few red flag signs that you would say in, in a nutshell, summarizing your talk, that we should always look for in any patient with uh, a known genetic disorder or even an unknown. So, so uh, I mean, one of the things I want to make clear is that that information that I'm giving you is I can only give you the information about the genetics because I have Hannah, Michelle, and now uh, uh, Kelly who work with me. My, my forte, my expertise is phenotype. I make a phenotypic uh, diagnosis and I talk to them and I say, look, this is what I think is going on. They tell me what the genotype might be or they do their counseling and the testing. 
I'm too busy to do counseling. And honest, that's not my personality. I'm not a counselor. So you, you don't have to become a counselor, even if you wanted to become interested in genetics. You become a really good observer of your phenotype. So going back to your question, in the clinic, if you see a child who's got eyes that are, the corneas are a little bit small and they have cataracts, don't just say, I'm going to do the cataract. Say, why would you get microcornea and cataract? And when you have time, or if you can get your technician or your counselor, if you're lucky enough to have one, to check OMIM or check one of the gene databases, and they may come back and say, microcornea and cataract could be seen in all of these things. I mean, it could be seen in rubella as well. It doesn't have to be genetic. The point is, don't ignore a sign because you're interested just in the cataract. Does that make sense? If the child looks different, if I always ask the question, who does this child look like? And then the children who have uh, like ocular dental digital uh, syndrome, the parents will often say, well, we always laugh because he doesn't look like anybody or she doesn't look like anybody. And there are, I'm sure, much better qualified people on the panel who'll tell you that there are syndromes like allergial syndrome where when you put all these children in a room together, they look like brothers and sisters because they have the same dysmorphic features. So you have to ask that question politely. Who does this child look like? And they go, doesn't look like anybody in the family. You just think, oh, maybe there's something going on. Yeah, thank you, sir. Um, uh, Annie, ma'am and Hannah, uh, could, would you like to answer that question? Or your point of view, what would be the red flag signs? Everybody will not have the advantage of a genetic counselor by their side. So if they really want to think that whether we, they should refer the patient to a genetic counselor or a geneticist, what are the uh, red flag signs that one should pick up in a patient while observing, apart from the ophthalmology uh, details? I always say that uh, I, certain features of the eye, the ophthalmologist is aware of that they are associated with certain genetic conditions. So they have that in the back of their mind. So those are the cases. One, two, like Ken said, any other, making it syndromic, that is not just the eye, but other things involved. Uh, and the third is a family history, which you can just ask. Anybody else in the family who had it or something similar? Is this new? So that sort of thing. And then you know that this requires further detailing. And Ken is absolutely right. Molecular testing is required only if you want to do further follow-up you want to do, if it's late onset and you want to see preventative or reproductive counseling and so on. Molecular testing is not essential, but identifying and helping the family is the most important. Hannah, do you want to say anything? Absolutely. So my general approach, I try to be consistent across all my patients because, and I have an example uh, to show when I give my talk. But when I'm thinking about review of systems, I always, tell the parents, I'm going to ask you literally from head to toe so that I don't miss anything. And I have key questions that I know from what phenotype Dr. Nichols is providing that I want to couple with. Um, and that way I know that I'm not going to miss something because I saw in the chat box, people were saying, what else should I look at besides hands, feet, and palate? Um, I say literally everything. That's where this holistic approach comes in. And if you're consistent about asking questions and have a consistent approach, I ask um, some of it's observational. I'm looking at a child and think they have microcephaly. The family might not endorse that, but I'm taking that head to toe look and asking head to toe questions. And I have some more details about that when I speak, but I think that that's important in trying to pull it together. Yeah, thank you. I think we'll move to Hannah's talk now. And while she's uploading the, her presentation, uh, there are two more poll questions for the audience. So uh, for the audience, if there is a po positive family history of a condition, is the pedigree charting ca carried out in your clinic? And if it is yes, is it every time or no, never or sometimes? Who counsels the family regarding the genetic implications? Is it a genetic counselor? Is it a clinical geneticist? Or you do it yourself or it is not carried out at all? So we have the privilege now of a genetic counselor, but before that, we used to do it ourselves. And I personally used to find it so difficult as Dr. Ken has mentioned that uh, it is not uh, very uh, possible to do in the clinic because of the time restraints. 
but uh, at the same time i felt myself uh, incompetent and incomplete in doing uh, counseling the way actually riya does it so uh, that's the importance of having a genetic counselor in the clinic made much more difference in the clinic and um, uh, the further importance i think uh, uh, hana would share in her talk so these are the results so it's very good to see that around 66% do it every time but there's a small portion which says that no never and 29% says that sometimes it is depending on the condition and many of the times it is the genetic counselor but the geneticist sometimes a clinical condition and not carried out at all in just 7% so we have a very good audience who is actually uh, kind of uh, convinced about genetic counseling so over to you hana for your talk now Okay, thank you very much for that introduction and I'm so pleased to be speaking today. I have very fond memories of my visit to Shroff Charity Eye Hospital in 2014 as well as uh, several other ophthalmic centers in India and um if not for COVID and hopefully we have future educational opportunities, I hope to see you all um in person again. So today I'm going to talk about practical ocular genetic counseling and what are the uh key components you can use. um especially if you do not have um access to genetic testing whether it's a financial aspect of a family or just the ability of the technology and so i always start briefly with our national society in the united states has put out this is our definition um that our role is to help people to understand and adapt to the different implications of their disease both medically psychologically and within the family but in order to get to this point to provide comprehensive genetic counseling um i find that in our subspecialty of ophthalmology there's a bridge that we have to uh cross and i find that these major components um really help me hone in on how to provide effective genetic counseling and test selection so i'm going to um summarize the key points that again with consistency might help you to achieve diagnoses especially in a clinical sense so when it comes to thinking about signs and symptoms this is where i rely on uh, dr nishal and all of our colleagues here um to relay what they're seeing in the eye and combined um with my head to toe view of the patient as well as the physicians actually being capable of doing the physical exam for signs that we're interested in the other things that i always like to add is what is the age of onset for the patient in front of you and to ask the parent i call it the vision story what brought you to this point today in our clinic what were the signs and symptoms of your child that you saw before your pediatrician noticed it what made you come here because often um i always say you know mother's instinct mother's always right or parents have an instinct they will actually reveal signs um that you might find important in getting to a a diagnosis because there may be signs of progression or other visual behaviors that you find important um and i will go through some case examples where this uh, became critical um i also ask my review of systems with our phenotype driven questions and then of course your chart review has your patient seen specialists have they had imaging or labs um those again can kind of refine what you're looking at and i have a good example um of a case for a family history about what really is necessary um and it helps you trace your phenotype dig deeper where you need to ask about consanguinity um and you can get recurrence risks just out of family histories alone without doing genetic testing but also we need to look at if we know the recurrence risk who's at risk in that family so it remains critical so what i'd like to do is give you some examples so these are three patients who presented to our clinic all for the same exact indication they were sent to us for childhood onset optic atrophy as you can see their visual acuities were all very similar at presentation and they were all found to have um a predominantly temporal optic pallor which um in the literature and in my experience usually points us right to OPA1 or dominant optic atrophy but if i were to start there alone i would not get the answer for all of these patients despite the identical appearance and story so this is where you really have to dig deeper um the pedigrees and the review of systems in these patients start to tease out the answers these are the practical approaches that allow you in the absence of genetic testing to be able to get to diagnoses that can inform your patients um for example the first case here was not much of a family history but he had congenital sensory neural hearing loss 
the patient in the middle had no other uh, systems involved, but did have a family history of optic atrophy, but with a decreased penetrance. And then in the third case, it was a teenage onset and she was somewhat obese and had a history of glucose intolerance. So this is where your clinical diagnoses become really relevant because what I begin thinking is how can I parse these out? Does my first patient have a syndrome that can combine with hearing loss? Does my second patient just have an isolated form? And does my third patient seem isolated or diabetes is unfortunately common, but could there be a syndrome here? So when I do these sorts of questions and kind of parse these out, I can start to get to a diagnosis. And if the situation allows, I could do single genes, but um, here in the United States, we do have the um, ability to do large panels, which I can capture all at the same time. And all three patients had different diagnoses despite coming for the same reason. My first patient had Wolfram-like, it's dominant. This implicates other family members and explains this hearing loss. My second patient was truly isolated. And my third had Wolfram syndrome, which her glucose intolerance will progress to diabetes. She may have an onset of hearing loss and there's significant other findings like cardiomyopathy and psychiatric illnesses that may be down the road for this patient. Not to mention that she has two younger siblings who are also at risk and showing nothing right now. So just in this way alone, um, while genetic testing helped me confirm what I was thinking, I was able to start targeting this. And this might be a practical approach to use because every patient might walk in and sound the same, but in fact are different. When I think about my pedigree, an example I'd like to give you here was an eight-year-old boy was referred to us for nystagmus. He had a history of a retinal attachment at the age of four. There was some question about whether it was actually uh, a head trauma, but the family didn't remember something actually hitting him in the head, but the gym teacher said that maybe a ball had hit him. And there was a maternal grandfather who had a history of a retinal attachment in his 30s. So this family was advised um, that this was X-linked and he had some sort of X-linked disorder. So when he presented to our clinic, this is where, um, while we traditionally think about a three generation family histor history, you always wanna ask a little further for something that um, might be relevant beyond these generations. And in fact, while this appeared X-linked through the female, when I got the extended family history, there were numerous males in the family with bilateral or unilateral retinal detachment. So again, someone could still think this is X-linked. Why are all the boys the only ones affected? But in fact, here we do have the male-to-male -male transmission of the trait. This allows us to rule out uh, X-linked and in fact, think about it in a dominant way. So again, doing that practical approach, digging a little deeper, um, actually changed the recurrence risk for this family, um, going from what would be an X-linked recurrence risk based on gender to 50% for the dominant risk. And in this fact, um, in this case, this child ended up by physical exam, we were also able to get to that clinical diagnosis where he did have the wedge-shaped cataract and vitreous abnormalities, and he was confirmed to be Stickler syndrome with a collagen 2 mutation. So I kept that little piece hidden because this clinical diagnosis will get you there as well, but that family history remains very important. And my last practical example I'd like to give you again is for recurrence risk. What happens when you can't get a genetic test or when your genetic test is not informative? Um, this was a four-year-old patient who pre presented for another evaluation of an eye abnormality. We found an isolated um, optic nerve and chorioretinal coloboma. There was no known family history. This was in both eyes and the patient and family wanted, they wanted genetic testing. After an in-depth review with a chromosomal microarray and an anterior segment gene panel, including coloboma genes, we came up with nothing. And mom shares she's expecting, wants to know if this could happen again. What we don't want to say is that this is not genetic. That's often a risk or an interpretation that patients think I had genetic testing, it was negative. So this must not be genetic. But we really, um, as Dr. Nischel said, um, have to start going to the literature and thinking about what's possible. We want to avoid telling patients they have a high risk or a low risk. That's a qualifying term that they may interpret very different from what you think. So the literature pearls come into play here. If there's no molecular diagnosis because it couldn't be done or it was uninformative, you have to consider, is there literature out there? And in this case, there is for coloboma. Is it 10%? Um, that's what the background risk would be um, based on families who do have patterns that were never able to be genetically identified. But what about the family in front of you? Could it be recessive? 
25% risk is their consanguinity. Um, there certainly are syndromes that could have in genes that have coloboma that are recessive, or there's a lot of uh, dominant traits of coloboma. Could that be in this family? Did you look at the parents? Um, did we find anything that could suggest this? So empiric 10% would cover all these recurrence risks, but is it accurate? So looking at that family members and your family pedigree, um, you know, in the prenatal world, genetic counselors may often say up to 50%. Um, but that's a very large risk to be giving a mother who's expecting and doesn't know. So you have to go and rely on these pearls in the literature and your family history to get to a practical point. Um, so I hope that through my presentation today, I was able to give you some examples of why the holistic approach is important, ocular, systemic, and family. Um, I always say consistency is key. There are variables there, but if you don't ask the same questions every time of all your patients, you might miss them because they can be different. And this is where I rely on my resources and colleagues and teamwork. Um, I have, you know, I had next to no ocular knowledge before starting uh, my career in ocular genetics. And I certainly attribute all that to Dr. Nischel and all my colleagues here. And, you know, my genetic counselors here um, and our team is wonderful. So going back and forth, we're always coming up with new ideas and new thoughts. So you're not alone in trying to diagnose your patients. So please use those around you. And thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I appreciate it. Thank you, Hannah. That was a great talk, and uh, it definitely reflected how time again, time and again, we keep saying deep phenotyping and um, at least three to four generations of family history is so important when you're trying to make a genetic diagnosis. And uh, leading on from that, actually, uh, uh, this is. I'm addressing a question from all genetic counselors in India as well, and uh, several other countries. We are now moving towards the end where. Uh, people are trying to become any qualification as genetic genetic counselors. And uh, is there uh, uh, is there uh, any special training that you took, any uh, modules, and what was the way you went about it? And uh, the second question uh, in conjugation with that would be uh, from Dr. Annie as well, that what is the approach that's taken in India? What are the qualifications required? What institutes are training right now? I'm sure everyone around would like to know the Indian perspective of it as well. Sure, so um, when you know, I think about what training, you know, every country of course is different. And while the United States does, as was mentioned, I think maybe when we were all offline talking about it, um, you know, we do have many programs with um, boards that require what our training is and what our competencies are. Even in the United States, ocular genetics in these training programs is extremely limited. Um, I received one embryology lecture about the eye, um, and then some of some new uh, members to our team uh, maybe got a lecture as well. So it's while well, there's exposure potential there for people to go seek clinical rotations, that might be the best way. Um, I find that when I started um, you know, spending time in the room with the ophthalmologist, if this is not a field that you're familiar with as a genetic counselor, building that base of ocular terminology, ocular examinations and what's getting done will then cross over to making sense of the literature and what is out there because there are a few textbooks while comprehensive um, can become outdated quickly because of how um, rapid ocular genetics knowledge is. So I encourage you to spend time with the ophthalmologists who are doing these detailed exams and combine that with your genetic training of um, thinking about all the systems in the body and how to approach a patient. It's really hands-on learning. And I think that that's the best way to synthesize. Yeah. Uh... Well, like Hannah said, we train people for the genetic principles uh, of counseling, psychology, social science, taking pedigrees, all that. But like you, Ria, or Akhilesh, who have been working closely with ophthalmologists, learn more about the eye diseases. So I would think in India, the, uh, we are too young a group to have specialist genetic counselors. But genetic counselors, when they are attached to different things like oncology or um, eye disorders or any specific uh, muscular disorders, they learn from the clinicians and you get familiar with the words. So the words uh, which come more commonly. And I know that in genetic counseling, like Hannah said, where she looks from top to toe and we also ask the family. So the words you use should be familiar words to the family. The family will tell you, we saw a white spot or we saw that the child was taking the thing close to the eye. 
So take that also as phenotypic points. And uh, I saw in the chat box somebody asking what, what is important about the onset of diagnosis. Uh, MPS like, you may not see it earlier, but the onset comes later for corneal clouding. So you may see, pic you can sometimes ask for earlier pictures of a child that, you know, progressive diseases you can look at. So things like that. And you learn with the more you work with, and that is how all health professionals do it. Not just genetic counselors, but also clinicians, that the more you learn, the more you become an expert of. So we can't have expert counselors, but Ria and Akhilesh can train others, Hannah can help us and so on. Yes, um, and also leading on from that, uh, uh, so what are the courses and uh, that are currently available in India and can optometrists and ophthalmologists also become genetic counselors? Yeah, see any what we have such few courses that I don't want to talk much about it. We have one year and two year courses of basic genetic counseling. Uh, two course, the two year courses are after graduation and their master courses are very similar to the US courses. The one year courses are after post graduation where they have already learned the basics of genetics and molecular biology, but we teach them about application, applying those to the real world situation. Because our, in India masters when we do, it's mostly theoretical done in universities. So although they have done genetics, MSc or PhD, they have not seen a patient. Okay, so that's where the thing comes. I don't want to take too much time, but it was said that when the British came to India to teach us uh, English in schools, we all had to learn a poem by Wordsworth called Daffodils. And some people in the south of India told, you know, I think we shouldn't have this poem here because nobody has ever seen a daffodil. So they said, okay, let's put a picture of a daffodil in every school. So that's what. So if you are not exposed to the clinical thing, then you never... Like a clinician never thinks of genetics, a geneticist doesn't think of the practicalities of the anatomy. Hi, Hena, I had a question. Oh, very nice talk. Do you ever have a situation where someone questions the need for genetic counseling or refuses to get genetic uh, counsel? Because we have that in India. Yes, uh, that does happen to us. And this is what. Um, I often say is the benefit of our specialty is, you know, in pediatrics, we're constantly bringing patients back for other um, ophthalmic follow-up needs. And so I have patients who are absolutely against it. Why are you in this room? I thought I was just here to get glasses today. Why are we talking about genetics? Um, but seeing that patient again, I might pop in at the four month follow-up for the um, glasses check and say, did you have any questions? How are you doing? And that, um, you know, without mentioning the genetics, often that presence or that time that allowed them to think um, really brings them full circle. Now, I know that may not be as possible um, for as much catchment as you have and as far as your patients do travel to see you. Um, that same approach may not work well um, for your centers, but um, I find that staying in touch or keeping involved is kind of what leads our patients to it. The alternative is the condition gets worse. Those are the patients who then change their mind as well. Thank you. And just a small follow-up question. Do the ophthalmologists, before sending them to you, actually counsel them? Or do they just say, do they just give them a little prelude to, Dr. Ken maybe could answer that. No, no, Arpan, I, I don't do it. I just say okay. they're going to see uh, uh, Hannah or one of her colleagues. Uh, I mean, I, I think I, uh, very briefly, I, it, if you're if you're not comfortable examining other parts of the body like the hands the teeth or the the palate you can always send patients to a pediatrician there's no doubt about that but if you don't even think about sending them to the pediatrician then and you don't even look at the hands you know, or the teeth and wonder if there's something wrong you're, you're not going to learn how to do that and also the patient's not going to see the pediatrician sure. so i think it, it is up to you to be inquisitive enough to ask the question why um, and then, as I said, I hand everything over to to, uh, to Hannah and her colleagues. Thank you, Dr. Ken and Hannah. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you. And uh, Hannah, uh, one more question. Have you also moved on to uh, teleconsults uh, during COVID time? And how do you feel about it? Is it, you find it as efficient uh, or even in general practice? Yeah, so your question's very timely. I'm starting my telemedicine clinic on Monday. <laughs> um, so here we have certain restrictions for telemedicine for genetics, um, genetic counselors. So that's been some hurdles for us to get over. Um, but for me, you know, when I am, am unable to meet the patient here in the appointment, um, then I have been following up with them by telephone. Um, I will talk equally as long on the telephone as I would in a telemedicine visit. And so I, um, I'm hoping that I see a bigger benefit from my patients, that face-to-face, -face, um, because they always say 90% of communication is nonverbal. And if I can't see how my patient's reacting, um, then I feel that that's a deficit, especially when, um, if we brought up the possibility of an ocular genetic disorder and we weren't able to meet that day, the, all they're getting is by phone. Um, plus, if I want to get a look at the patient, of course, telemedicine will be valuable. So I think that this is a positive way for us to provide genetics care um, if they've had that complete exam and you know the phenotype you're looking for. Yeah, so uh, thank you. We had a great discussion. Now we'll move on to the next uh, talk uh, by Dr. I.C. Verma on genetic testing, when and how. Before that, uh, just another two uh, poll questions. So um, Dr. Ken mentioned that um, testing is not required or in all cases, but exactly when it is required uh, would be answered by Dr. I.C. Verma now. And these are the two questions pertaining to testing and I would request everyone to answer it. So how do you think genetic testing is useful for hereditary disorders? It is a multiple choice question. So uh, you can answer more than one question. Uh, one, one answer, sorry and uh, one of the options and what are the major hurdles in referring patients for genetic testing and counseling in the current scenario so this is something that we also face in every day-to-day -day life uh, and practice that whenever we send to counselor it is first of all it is thought that it is for a genetic testing uh, and uh, the patients uh, just ask that why do you want to send me or why do you want to do the testing so um, wanted to see what other participants also uh, think about it so uh, sharing the results. So most of them agree that genetic testing is useful. Around 90% is useful, uh, not useful at all. We did not get any answer. How the main limitation was financial constraints. Yes, in India it is because uh, insurance does not sponsor for it. Uh, others, uh, there's a quite around one third, one fourth saying that there's a limited benefit in management. Also the patients do not understand it is a very huge number, 41% and uh, limited access to a genetic counselor and geneticist is another op uh, chosen option. Even the genetic laboratory, they are not having access to. So we have a crowd who has problems uh, with the, the further step that is the genetic testing. So over to you, Dr. Verma, to solve some of these questions through your talk. All right. So can you see my slide or? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, and you can see my slide. Yes, sir, please go ahead. Okay. So I'm all set. So I must uh, at the outset thank uh, Shalja for arranging this uh, interesting symposium and giving me a chance to speak in it and trying to uh, whip up some interest among ophthalmologists in genetics. So ophthalmology and genetics have been fairly close all the time because more genes are expressed in the eye than in any other organ except the brain. And the first textbook on genetics was written by a Swiss ophthalmologist, Wardenberg, and he ran into three volumes. So the benefits of genetic testing are many. It makes you a precise diagnosis because the phenotypes may look similar and it saves you time and money in spending on the various investigations. It can, once you know the diagnosis, you can inform about prognosis and therapy. And of course, it, most important, it helps you in reproductive options. Because so people are always worried, can this happen again? So then, of course, we can help the relatives. I think in the, these days of precision medicine, it's better to know what is the molecular etiology of the particular disease, because a lot of new treatments are coming based on the molecular etiology. And as geneticists say, you first treat the patient, and then you treat the family. So the technology, the next-gen sequencing, has really revolutionized the practice of medicine. 
So if you look at the left side, you see to sequence the human genome, it costs $2.7 billion. And this has put, the cost has come down so much. The cost has come down so much that it now costs only uh, $1,000 to $2,000 to sequence the whole genome. And this has really changed uh, the genetic testing and other forms of testing in various diseases. So what gene to study, you can often get a history, uh, information from the family history. So this couple had come and uh, accompanied by her parents as, as well as his parents. And then they said this, her brother had blindness and can, can it happen again? So it had done, the eye was totally disorganized and one could not really say anything. After they had gone away, the um, parents of the lady came and said, you see, the issue is that um, the mother's sister also had a child with a similar disease. So this immediately suggested to me that, um, what is this going on? Suggested to me that this is an X-linked disease and the Norris disease occurred to mine and then we sequenced the gene and fortunately she was not a carrier. So the issue now is that as uh, Dr. Ken has been saying that we have to look beyond the eye, look at the patient and if there are abnormalities in other organs and uh, maybe either you refer to a geneticist, if you are competent yourself, fine, otherwise refer to a geneticist or a physician or a pediatrician. If there are malformations, we used to do chromosomes, but now we will do a microarray. And then of course, these are the molecular studies. So the molecular tests vary from single gene studies by single sequencing to panels and whole genomes. So these are the disorders I'm going to briefly touch upon and show you how we select which technology to use to uh, test these patients. So here was a family, this is the man and his daughter, and they had this blepharophimosis, BPES, ptosis and blepharophimosis and uh, situs inversus. So Fox L2 gene. So we sequenced and found this mutation. And um, this interesting gene, because it's involved in the development of the ovary. And the, the, if it's in a woman, she might get, uh, uh, you know, uh, ovarian failure earlier, pre premature ovarian failure. So here's a case of congenital glaucoma. Look at this pedigree. Consanguinous family, they lost two children. He died at five years, five months. Sorry, I was doing a better leave. He died at five months from congenital glaucoma. The second one died at four months. And the third one came at 21 days with congenital glaucoma. So I asked this family, didn't nobody tell you that you could do a prenatal? And we went, another child. She said, I went to so many pediatricians. I went to so many ophthalmologists, nobody told me one could do a prenatal. So I think this is what I hope all the people among you will not belong to this category. So in a, we found this mutation, but in Hyderabad, they have decided a common Indian mutation, which uh, we didn't find in our series. And um, so this, we see the garret atrophy of the retina, we see often once in every five or six months and the myopia and poor vision. And if you do the fundus, you will find these changes. And we can do a biochemical test by doing the estimation of the, um, the ornithine. And we always try pyridoxin because some of them respond and we find the mutation. So this is actually a gene for mitochondria. And this is another mitochondrial disease called the Leber's hereditary optic atrophy. You start a painless starting off the edema around the optic nerve and then going on to optic atrophy. So you look at this family, not all those who are positive for the mutation were showing the disease. So these people had the mutation, but they, and that is bad because of how many of the mitochondria are abnormal? Is heteroplasmy and what percentage? And so he was actually the boy, this boy here with an eternal uncle who had come to see us. So we have now studied we got 282 referrals over uh, 210 to 2020, and but only 81 were positive. And we found maximum mutations were present in the T11A78A mutation. The next disease I want to touch is the albinism. This causes serious problems in India, although in, in the West, it is not that much of a problem. But certainly, there are a lot of problems in the pharmacological practice. The poor vision is a big problem. So 50, 
lot of cases are common cases are the tyrosine is negative and this is a common mutation which is a termin x mutation and uh, but there are the other genes which can be involved the p gene and the t so we have a panel of this ocm1 2 and 3 now the cataract i would like to on the ophthalmologist to remember that always please please exclude galactosemia and the galactokinase deficiency because these are two disorders which can be treated and these are uh, and so uh, never miss a treatable disorder that's what i always tell uh, my uh, students and um, so we found in our own series we found 11 out of 73 with isolated cataract and genital cataract 15% had the gall enzyme the gall and uh, not gall it should be gall enzyme de deficiency sorry so in prasad in chandigarh did the study and found 8% had the uh, galactokinase deficiency so i think it's very important then of course cataract occurs as a large number of disorders with the uh, systemic disorders so here's a big family so on the red left side is the people who had bilateral cataracts congenital transmitted as a dominant on the left side is the patient family with the lca so you find this um, so we uh, did ngs said sequence we did ngs uh, for both of them and uh, and for one the catac panel and the other one we did the lca or the retinal dystrophy panel and we found a mutation the first one i think the catax uh, we need to do more studies in india because there's only one study in india by done by dr dada at all india sure and he found mutation only in 18% although she had studied only 14 genes so we need to do more studies in these to identify our common mutations so here's a case that like came from to us from london this lady here she had retinitis pigmentosa and the history was that her father also had retinitis pigmentosa so it looked more like a dominant but actually when we did the studies we found there were mutations in both the alleles so it was actually a recessive so this was like a most like a pseudo dominant and uh, the further study showed that there was a mutation in the um, the circle gene but this we think is the founder mutation in the community in north india and which we are under publication so i cannot disclose the actual mutation today so retinal dystrophies are common everywhere one in 2000 if you combine everything very many genes 200 more than 250 genes but we need to know the gene and uh, because to counsel and therapy because i know when the gene therapy came up of some of these patients the many patients flock to us that please i want to find out what is my gene what is the defect in which gene is defective so we have studied 36 cases of retinal dystrophies over the last 4 uh, uh, or 5 years and we find pathogenic mutations in 25 69% so this is pretty good and these are list below some of the disorders the genes that we have discovered which are not discovered but found the mutation so retinal blastoma i think this is a simple classification i use that if the family history is positive then whether it's unilateral or bilateral you are likely to find a germline mutation while if there is no family history if it's a bilateral you will find a germline mutation while if it's a unilateral you will find a germline mutation in 15% now the issue comes in here is so there was a one slide which seems to have got somewhere missing and uh, the issue now is the patient come to us for prenatal so prenatal not difficult when is bilateral and a germline mutation it's a is the is it is the sporadic cases which is a problem but there you need a tumor so that we can help them we have to find out which allele is lost unfortunately it is almost impossible to get a piece of the tumor in india mostly the it is put into formalin and put into the museum so i think i this i will entreat all of them all is that when you take out this tumor please send or save some for gene studies because when these patient come for the next pregnancy they come to us the doctor please help us so this is my last slide of take home messages that uh, you find that we have the starting from the left we have the singular sequencing and you go on to the right to the panels of clinical exome exome whole exome and then you the issue is now which one to decide for your patient so what i can tell you what i use and whether it will help you you can uh, 
So if it's a small gene, and we know it's only just one gene, or even two small genes, we will do Sanger sequencing. But if we find even a single gene, but it's very large, we will go into NGS because the cost is reduced. For example, retinoblastoma, it used to cost us to see, sequence this almost one lakh of rupees. And now you can do it in 20,000 rupees. And now if you have a, a, a phenotype, which is due to number of genes, and, um, but we know this number is not too many more new ones, so you can do the panel. But if you find there are many other genes, which we don't know yet, so either we do a clinical exome or we do the exome if we know less about the other genes. Clinical exome is you look only at the genes which are included in OMIM, which have some function. While in exome, you will be studying all the 20,000 genes. In the whole genome, I'm sure that in a few years, this is going to become routine. But now at the moment, it is more like a research here. So gentlemen, so I think the question now is, so here's the, my last slide to acknowledgement of the, my colleagues who help us in the studies. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Verma, excellent talk. This is Dr. Gandhi. Uh, I just wanted to add, uh, I'm an ocular pathologist. So we get tissue for both, tumor tissue for both ocular pathology and also the option to keep it in the biorepository. So we, we have a special fi uh, fixative for it and we can keep it in that. So that's another option that can be used for tumor tissues. So for all your, all your cases of retroblastoma, you keep the tissue? We, we are going to be starting with that. But yes, we do. We do have that in mind also. Your big health. Your big health. You know, when these people are worried because they don't want another child like this. And when you have an enucleation and you have that tumor, so you don't want to spoil the morphology and as well as get uh, everything done on one go. Thank you. So that brings to a very good uh, topic of biorepository, the roles and um, how they would be helpful in further research. I think even uh, Narayan Netrale has a good biorepository. Dr. Arka can add to it that, and we have also started and uh, started at least collecting the blood samples and would be starting the tumor tissues as well. So uh, maybe Dr. Arkan can uh, comment on that. And uh, does UPMC do it? Dr. Ken, he can also add on to it. So um, ophthalmology doesn't do it. I think that the, the cardiology unit for UPMC, both adults and children, do have a uh, bio data bank. Um, the problem, and I, Hannah, you might have to uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the problem with getting bio data banks now is that there is so much worry about the privacy issues of the patients that a lot of patients and a lot of IRBs are not willing to have a, a data breach with uh, information about somebody's uh, genetic profile. And that is something that we should be worried about. You know, we, we should be very worried about uh, storing blood samples indefinitely, uh, or rather DNA, I should say, uh, because as, as many people are saying on the um, chat that, you know, uh, when you do whole exome or whole genome sequencing, you, you can pick up stuff that you weren't expecting. And um, uh, so that, that, for me, that's the big concern. And uh, we just don't have a bio data bank for that reason. Hannah, would, anything to add? Yeah, I just, from the patient perspective, um, they're often willing to do the genetic testing, but having that long-term data stored, even at the genetic testing laboratories, often becomes an issue of consent. Um, so I just think the families um, here, we fortunately have pretty good access and coverage of genetic testing, and they're getting, they're meeting their goal. Um, so I think also that getting patient enrollment in a biobank would be difficult, but you know, we certainly do use the ocular pathology samples in many ways to get testing done. So we still play some role in that, but not long-term banking. But, you know, we call American College of Medical Genetics. They have made recommendations what you might reveal, what other things that you, uh, apart from what you are testing for. So we follow the goal direction. And only those conditions which can be helped in some way, we can help the patient. That those things are revealed. The other way we don't reveal. No, no, I, I agree. I know the intention is good. It's just, it's yeah. very difficult for us to commit our IRBs to allow us. Organizations to... always know. 
Yeah. Dr. Arka, would you like to add on to the biorepository experience at Narayan Nitrale? Yeah, so we do have an extensive biorepository and uh, uh, each sample that is stored in the biorepository comes with its own consent form. And this flows and act uh, that the patient gives you uh, the consent for it. And what we typically store is, um, and why our IRB uh, allows it, is we do not change any of the clinical processes or uh, methodology to acquire these samples. So they are typically uh, like surgical waste, for example, or pathology samples, or if you are taking a blood sample anyhow for uh, whatever other condition, if the patient agrees in the same draw, uh, to give you a sample for you know, DNA or transcriptomics or whatever other reason. So we store that and um, that almost all of these samples are typically used for research studies, um, not necessarily to, um, to give anything back to the patient. So the patient actually signs off on it saying that uh, this is for a research study and I will not have any uh, access to the research results apart from whenever the publication comes out. But, but can you access the patient's details from the information that you keep about that patient, you know, whether it's you have tissue? You they... the data, so you do not do have the identifiers of the patient, but you Good. do have access to all the clinical information. Yeah, so, sure. I see. Yeah. Perfect. Could I add one thing? Uh, Dr. Anna Middleton from Cambridge uh, she is uh, working on the ethics uh, about of uh, sharing of data from both biorepository as well as genetic genomic data. And she has floated a survey for, called Your DNA, Your Say, because uh, NHS has the uh, sequencing for that 100,000 genome project. And what, according to her preliminary results, she says that patients and families usually are not worried about using it for academic research purposes, but they are definitely worried that it should not be misused for illegal forensic or governmental or insurance purposes. Absolutely. And they are working out a policy, uh, ethics policy about this, and let's see what comes out of it. She was part of the webinar which we had on uh, 4th of July third, fourth, or fifth July, and she told us. And this survey is available in different countries and uh, preliminary data they are publishing as of now. So, Thank uh, you everyone for the biorepository feedback. Yeah, Shalja, sorry, you were saying something. Uh, we have a unique mix of uh, geneticists and lab people here. So Dr. I.C. Verma works in a multi-specialty hospital, Dr. Arka in the eye hospital, and Dr. Sam Balu is from a, a commercial uh, testing lab. So I would ask to, I'd like to ask all three of them that what proportion of your genetic tests belong to purely ophthalmological disorders? Just to know uh, what is the trend of testing in India? What would you think? 100%. <laughs> we are an eye. Yours is 100% definitely. <laughs> but in that, what would be the commonest uh, disorder then? Um, I mean, Posterior segment, anterior segment. So retinal disorders are the ones that are the commonest. Um, retinoblastoma. Um, corneal disorders are also there, but uh, rarer um, that go for genetic counseling because with the cornea, you do have surgical options. So uh, I think. Uh, the cornea surgeons um, need to get involved in genetic counseling and genetic testing a little bit more than the retina ones. Dr. Sam? All the disorders that I mentioned, we do it in-house. Although some of the NGS we do, you know, give to other laboratories, but we do have a bioinformatics. We have the main issue is of reading these uh, interpretations, interpreting the NGS. So that we have a bioinformatics ourselves. Uh, so most of these, is the uh, many uh, this, uh, genes tests, which are entirely only for ophthalmology. But of course, we establish them. We are also more of a diagnostic laboratory. So as the patients come, we set up the test. Yes, sir. Right. Um, so, Dr. Shailaja, uh, regarding our experience, uh, I would say roughly 10% of our cases come from an op ophthalmology point of view. Uh, it is uh, 
like Dr. Verma said, that you know it's maybe a little bit underrepresented in in our population, which gets prescribed for genetic testing currently. Uh, that is something uh, during the talk, I'm seeing that there's a lot of interest, not just in India, but from across the world. But in India, unfortunately, it's a bit underprescribed and majority of our cases in the 10% would be RP and retinal cases, which are referred. So that is our experience. And of course, one of the things which uh, uh, I would like to talk about for a couple of minutes is you know, developing these kind of customized, small targeted panels, which could really make it more cost effective to do these kind of testing. So that is something which I'm looking to learn from everyone on our esteemed panel today. And, you know, hopefully be able to give some solutions to the patients in terms of genetic testing. But now, you know, uh, Sam, the costs are not that much. I mean, for 20,000, you get an exome, you get a right, exome. His price is, uh, it only we are afraid to ask the patient. And for a patient, he's so worried, he's willing to spend this money. Yes. There's not much for him. Yes, he, sir. He the whole the life panels that are available now. Lots of retinal dystrophy panels, corneal dystrophy panels, uh, even retinoblastoma comes as a set. Uh, yeah, so without a gene study, quite, quite the well. is how, do, how can you get treatment? How is a gene therapy trial? You will never get into a trial unless you know what's the... the no, sir. Know. Very true. Exactly. So in interest of time, I would uh, uh, ask Dr. Arka to start sharing his slides and put up the final poll for the audience. So uh, can, if the audience can see the questions now, yeah, they can see now. So how commonly do patients inquire about gene therapy in your uh, clinical practice? And do you struggle to inform your patients about current gene therapy opinions or ad advances in research and clinical trials? So that is kind of setting the base for Dr. Arka's talk, who would be talking to us about uh, therapeutics and the avenues for gene uh, therapy, which uh, ultimately is a desire for every uh, genetic disorder. Uh, unfortunately, it's a very long road. And um, let's see what our audience have to say. So I'm sharing the results now. So actually, patients are not aware that anything uh, 61 persons do not inquire about gene therapy and equally small amounts uh, inquire about gene therapy. And yes, people do struggle. So definitely Dr. Arka's talk would be kind of helping them now. So over to you, Dr. Arka. Great, thank you. All right, my slides are visible, I hope. Yes. All right, so uh, let me start by um, first thanking uh, uh, Dr. Shailaja and the organizers for uh, having me here to uh, speak. And it's been uh, wonderful that um, all the uh, esteemed speakers before me have already told how important it is to know the genetics of uh, these diseases mm -hmm. and how we can uh, learn about the gene that's uh, mutated. So gene therapy essentially is uh, a way of correcting the uh, effect of the defective genes. Okay, so uh, there are two fun, or uh, there are four fundamental approaches. And the first one, which is the most commonest one, is that you put in a normal copy of the gene into the cell to compensate for the non functional or misfunctional gene. So uh, obviously, this uh, works primarily for recessive disorders, where you can just put the wild type gene or the correct copy of the gene in, and it'll fix the condition. The second option is where you trade the abnormal copy of the gene with a normal copy. Uh, this is by recombination. And you typically want to do this, particularly for dominant phenotypes, where the mutant copy uh, uh, is the one that prevails over the normal copy. Another way of fixing uh, dominant phenotypes as well as uh, recessive phenotypes is uh, through gene editing or selective reverse mutation. So that's the third way. A fourth way is to partially correct the gene. So this is what is done in exon skipping therapies uh, that are already out where uh, if a mutation or a premature stop codon is in a certain uh, exon, you can just skip over and make the rest of the protein and hope that the rest of the protein gives you uh, some amount of function so you can ameliorate the disease. And finally, there's a change in regulation of the genes where you are not changing uh, the gene which is 
overexpressed or underexpressed or something, you're changing something in the pathway where some other gene regulates your uh, gene that you're trying to change. So this is typically the method employed for cancers. So like the uh, overexpression of P53, which is done in Jendicin for Hellenic cancers. So essentially, uh, the cartoon here uh, shows you how you can package the, the DNA that contains your gene into a vector, which is like a, uh, like a parcel, and that goes into the cell or the tissue uh, where it needs to act, produces the protein. So how are these, uh, these correct genes uh, or DNAs delivered? So you use uh, various vectors. They can be viral vectors, non-viral vectors, and I've listed some of these here. So the key thing to remember that is uh, different between these two is that viral vectors have naturally evolved to deliver genetic cargo into cells. So we essentially hijack that ability of the virus, remove their genes and put in our gene of choice and achieve that. So that is a very efficient method, but it also carries the risk of uh, immune response. Whereas in non-viral vectors, this is chemically made and uh, they typically work several log fold lower in efficiency compared to viral vectors. But then there are uh, different uh, conditions or different situations where you would prefer to use a non-viral over a viral. And that would be dependent on the kind of disease you're trying to treat, the kind of tissue you're trying to treat, what sort of pre-existing inflammation and uh, toxicity is present in the tissues, et cetera. So what about gene therapies around the world? So currently, obviously, there are no gene therapy trials in India. But uh, this, these pie charts that I'm going to show you tell you a little bit about the, uh, the gene therapies that are happening around the world. And there are lots of gene therapy trials happening around the world. Uh, bulk of them use adenoviruses and retroviruses. A lot of adeno-associated virus gene therapies are happening. And of course, nanoparticle and plasmid or uh, episome-mediated trials are also happening. By far, the most number of trials are happening in the United States, almost two thirds of it. This is followed by the United Kingdom, Germany, China, etc. Bulk of these trials are in cancer. Again, two thirds of these trials are happening in cancer, followed by monogenic diseases and a lot of ocular diseases as well. And I'll tell you why uh, ocular diseases is picking up a uh, great pace over the last four or five years. And finally, in terms of phases of trials, obviously, again, uh, bulk of the trials are in phase one, but a fair number of them actually have now moved to phase three, four. Some of them are already entering the market. So let's talk about uh, success story. So that is uh, the LCA2 uh, gene therapy, which was uh, started in uh, Moorfields Eye Hospital by uh, Shoin Bhattacharya, Jim Bainbridge, and uh, Robin Ali, uh, and simultaneously also at UPenn by Gene um, uh, Bennett and a group. And uh, this was really the poster child for gene therapy, the first successful one, which everybody uh, knew about and brought spotlight back on gene therapy to be a success story. So this is now available. And apart from this here, I list a bunch of these uh, gene therapies that are now um, available. So the blue box is all cell therapies. These are all for hematological disorders. So the, the orange box is what shows you a number of gene therapies. And you will notice that most of them, hemorrhagic, Kimria, uh, Jendicin, Yaskata, Provenge, these are all for uh, various kinds of cancers. Glybera came out in Europe uh, by Unicure. This is for lipoprotein lipase deficiency. And uh, of course, Lextana is for RP. So a number of companies, so there are literally hundreds of companies now in the gene therapy space. And I've listed some of these key players here who have clinical um, uh, trials in late phases and are ready to enter the market with some new products. The challenge has been the cost of it. So they've all, each treatment costs uh, a million or more. So that has been the real challenge. So we'll talk about that uh, later on. So what 
we work on is a recombinant adeno-associated virus for uh, gene therapy. So the reason for it is it's really the gold standard in safety amongst the viral vectors right now. It doesn't integrate. It has very low toxicity and uh, immune activity or immune reaction, uh, which is seen only when the dose is uh, in quadrillion uh, uh, viral particles per patient. So, so those kinds of high doses give it. Uh, the key thing what AV uh, enjoys is that it can efficiently deliver genes to both dividing and non-dividing cells, which is a key um, uh, factor over lentiviruses. So this is just an example of uh, gene therapy gene uh, that we've done in the past. Uh, this shows gene delivery into the retina using two different vectors. This is the green fluorescent uh, protein. So you can see that the entire retina lights up, but particularly uh, using this particular serotype AV9, we are able to transduce the uh, outer plexiform layer apart from other layers. So obviously uh, lots of groups did these kinds of experiments and a lot of these led to clinical trials for uh, gene therapy. So uh, in, in, uh, in retinal diseases, so you can see here a lot of trials in achromatopsia, uh, AMD, uh, choroideremia, uh, LHON, et cetera. So all of these are going to hopefully come into the market pretty soon. And uh, every uh, few months, new ones are being uh, announced. So this is the new one announced for uh, Stargardt gene therapy. Uh, recent one that came out just a few days ago is for another retinitis pigmentosa uh, gene therapy on using PRPF31. So how about the cornea? So this is again some of our data um, with uh, that we've been working on gene therapy with our collaborator, uh, Dr. Rajiv Mohan in uh, University of Missouri. And what you can see, uh, and cornea specialists would uh, uh, appreciate this here, that this is a model of uh, corneal haze uh, induced by refractive surgery. And when you use AV delivered SMAD7, which blocks the TGF beta pathway, you can clear that up very nicely and get vision back. So uh, gene therapy for cornea is also being done by lots of groups, although none of them are in uh, clinical trials yet. So uh, currently gene therapy people have tried for uh, prevention of fibrosis, graft rejection, corneal neovascularization, as well as allergy conditions. So uh, using both viral and non-viral uh, vector strategies. All right. So to the key question, how do we bring gene therapy uh, to India and what are the broad challenges that we have? So the first challenge, of course, is to build a vector production facility. So we have to build uh, the, the drug production capacity in the country. So uh, that requires not just production of the vectors, but also developing clinical models for testing of the gene therapy products. The second thing, obviously, is to establish the regulatory process and ensure ethical practices. And to that, ICMR has already established the national gene therapy guidelines. Uh, third is to have national patient registry for diseases and mutations. This is exactly what uh, Dr. Verma was mentioning. And other people were also mentioning that if you want to have a therapy, we need to know what gene is mutated in you. And finally, we absolutely need to create awareness, both within the ophthalmology community, as well as within our patient groups so that we can identify clinical teams as well as uh, patient advocacy groups, which can help, uh, help the patients in general. So what are we as a group doing? So we have developed a gene therapy vector production facility. So this is a class 100 uh, gene therapy vector production facility that we have developed so that we can have our own vectors made here. The key bottleneck for gene therapy has been the pricing. So we are hoping that building everything ground up, uh, building, making the vectors here, having our own uh, uh, vector designs that will help reduce the cost for uh, the patients in India. So that's the whole aim. And uh, this is the uh, national guidelines for gene therapy product uh, development and clinical trials. We also contributed to, uh, the, to this document. So to summarize, uh, both viral and non-viral vectors have really come a long way. And in the last four or five years, uh, gene therapy has been 
really taking off around the world. So we have a great opportunity to do that in India. Uh, functional platforms for the reproduction needs to be established. We have established such a platform. There are other centers involved in gene therapy research and uh, hope to go to trials. We have IIT, Kanpur, uh, uh, Intas, Immunil, et cetera, working on CAR T cell therapies. IIT Mumbai, uh, CMC Vellore actually works on CAR T cell therapies as well as uh, hematological uh, disorder gene therapies. Uh, there we have us as well as IIT uh, Kanpur who work on um, uh, both IG gene therapies as well as muscle gene therapies. So hopefully in the next five years, we're gonna see some of these gene therapies come into uh, the clinic. Uh, but this is the right time for clinicians as well as patient organizations and advocacy groups to join hands, raise awareness, raise funding for research and bring uh, gene therapy into India. So I'd like to thank my team, particularly my collaborators uh, around the world on gene therapy and uh, genetic models. And this is our department. So with that, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arka. That was a great talk. And uh, this is the first optimistic statement about gene therapy we have heard in a very long time. You promising something like five years. Everyone always says it's uh, uh, quite a thing in the future. And uh, uh, it's really great to see that there's so much uh, work going on. So uh, leading on from that, uh, one of the questions is that, uh, and this question extends to Dr. Arka uh, and ma'am, uh, uh, everybody, uh, that, uh, do you get a lot of queries about enrollment to clinical trials? Mm -hmm. So uh, how approachable is it to enroll our patients into those clinical trials? Right. Is it right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so that is a question that our uh, genetic counselors face all the time. Uh, so certain trials uh, in certain countries do accept. Uh, patients from elsewhere, uh, but uh, in general, most trials don't. So uh, like some of the Moorfields trials, I know um, uh, Anu, who does the genetic counselor, uh, counseling in our place, uh, she has been in touch with the, um, uh, the PIs in Moorfields Eye Hospital, and they've been in touch going through patient records uh, after signing all the uh, required um, uh, documents uh, to, to figure out whether they'll fit into those trials. And of course, the, the challenge really is whether the family can afford to take up the cost of that because you, you not only, I mean, en enrolling in the trial is free, but you have to stay there typically for an extended period of time to do all the testing required, all the follow-up required, and that's a huge economic drain. So uh, not everybody is able to do, but that having been said, um, in my uh, in our patients in muscular dystrophy, uh, some of them we were able to hook up to uh, a trial, which was essentially um, uh, something related to the work I was doing earlier. So that uh, they were able to go there, although after staying for a certain amount of time, then they didn't qualify for the final round, so they had to come back. But but it is possible. So you as, as as a genetic counselor, you have to reach out to the trial administrators there and work out whether they'll be able to uh, accommodate somebody. Okay. Dr. Annie, uh, do you have anything to add to that? What we do is we, uh, wherever, whenever we have got a molecular diagnosis and we know that there is a clinical trial for a particular variant, like we had for, like uh, Dr. Ghosh said, for DMD. NIMS was, uh, National Institute here in uh, Hyderabad, was doing it for with uh, Dr. Meena. So we already uh, had the ones which had exon deletions and those which had missense variants. So we were able to quickly contact the families and the genetic counselors naturally do it. The lists are with the genetic counselors. And when you talk about advocacy groups and NGOs, and that's what's happening. Most of our genetic counselors are being taken by companies and not so many are available in hospitals. And I don't know, Dr. Ghosh has such a big center. I don't know how many counselors he has. So the counselors need time to go back, contact them. And in India, the trouble is the same patients don't stick with the same hospital. They are free to go anywhere. So you lose them. 
So unless you have a good track record and you are following them up, when an opportunity comes, it, you need to get the right people to put them through. We have done the same for MPS ones, SMN this time when uh, they were talking. So by the time we had our patients which fit in that, there were six of them. And then Dr. Ghosh is right. Only two of them were willing to spend that money even to go to Bangalore. So then it becomes from then that's where we find, try to find philanthropic people who can help them out. So there are a couple of NGOs which are helping our patients. Uh, unfortunately, with the um, uh, changing times, uh, the funding for these uh, people have uh, also become less. Because now, you know, with the GST and all this coming up, even giving money for charitable causes, more than 10,000, you have to give your PAN card and also people are not paying that much. So the, I've seen that in the past three years, the people who used to help a lot with genetic testing and all, they're saying we have money only for helping with treatment of patients. But this is very important that we have the correct variants and are ready to know that which people, Netherlands group are very good to take people for DMD and all. They have been really nice and understanding about it. So Dr. Ghosh, mm -hmm. it's, uh, the CRISPR has uh, become very useful. Yes. Because you take out the stem cells from the bone marrow and correct them and put them back. Now, has something like that been applied to the eye? Yes, so this has been done for uh, AMD. So that was the first one done. That was done back in uh, 2015. I think even before it came in for the hematologic disorders, it came in for AMD for the eye. Uh, so, uh, I mean, the, the, they made the RPE out of it and it transplanted the RPE in there. And it see, seems to be stable in there. Uh, uh, there has been some amount of vision improvement of that, but the, these initial trials were done in uh, very old age patients with very poor vision. So the fact that it survived and there wasn't uh, much toxicity is the positive that we can take out of it. But definitely it paves the way for us to utilize this for younger patients. So for retina, there is no stem cell? Ah, <laughs> retinal stem cells. So that's a big scientific uh, uh, you know, uh, debate whether there do exist stem cells inside the retinal layer. But irrespective of that, the way uh, people are trying to do it is take the blood, convert it into iPSCs, and then correct it, and then do that. Yes. So uh, I know the MRTK gene that has been corrected, and I... germline. You can go at the germline. No, no, not John. Uh, what, uh, what role do you I play? I made a mistake. I talked about the IPSC and AMD and not CRISPR. So okay. the CRISPR one is yet to come. The IPSC is, is the one that was done okay. in Japan. No, it looks to me, CRISPR is a technology which we can use in India. Uh, it's not that complicated like the other things. No, no, no. CRISPR is more complicated than gene augmentation. Believe me, I'm trying to do CRISPR. The, the problem of CRISPR even now is the percentage correction. So your first hurdle is how many cells you're able to reach. Right. And then within the cells that you've reached, only a small proportion actually gets corrected. So then that creates a double hurdle. So, uh, but in well, certain could, it will work well, 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 blood disorders, I think it will work quite well because you have an amplification stage. But for uh, mm -hmm. post-mitotic, it will be a little more challenging to do CRISPR. Dr. Annie had a question for uh, Hannah. I think we'll take that last question and after that uh, we need to... Yes. Uh, Hannah, I wanted to know because we were talking about the Indian scenario. How is it for you all to enroll people in clinical trials? Sure. So um, at the point of diagnosis when we're doing the post-test genetic counseling, um, prior to going into that session, um, we are always checking clinicaltrials.gov and any other resources available for our patients. Um, a big issue for us is there's so much media attention, as I'm sure there is for you, um, as far as the patient expectation of what gene therapy can provide, what genes are available. Um, so that's one clinical hurdle that we're actually actively looking at here on how to provide better education to patients. 
um, ongoing long term is, as you mentioned, you know, tracking those patients developing that way to make sure you remain in contact. Um, there are good resources um, and internet registries available for patients to remain in contact. If you're familiar with the Foundation of Finding Blindness, my retina tracker, um, they send out email blasts, but only, um, you know, through current opportunities, not things in development. Um, so we maintain internal databases that we query um, anytime there may be discussion of a new gene therapy that we're being asked, um, do we have patients um, that do meet the qualifications for the study, at least at the molecular level? And then we are reaching back out to our patients. And again, that's where I think the um, fortunate use of our specialty and seeing patients back, I'm integrated into the ocular clinic. I'm not in a genetics clinic with medical genetics, I'm specific to ophthalmology. So I'm having those repeat interactions to update our patients, um, which I realize can be unique to our scenario. Um, but that, as you all mentioned, the tracking, the contact, you know, that's gonna be our long-term issue because therapies will come and will our patients be there for us to get in contact with when the time is right. So uh, thank you everyone. What an information loaded uh, webinar we had today. So, uh, I would just like to take this opportunity to thank everyone. And uh, this would not have happened without the panelists and the speakers who have made the session so interactive with the audience. Also, they play a very important role in generating those interactions and initiating them. I would like to thank uh, our sponsors for the, uh, sponsoring this session. Also, our supporters for genetics, the Global Life Genetic Consortium, especially Dr. Gyan Prakash, Dr. Ivata, and Dr. Natarajan, University of Wisconsin Medicine, Dr. Terry Young and her team and Guru Nanak Dev University in Amritsar, Dr. Vanita and her team, they have always supported us and inspired us to go ahead in genetic, both in diagnosis as well as for research. And the backbone of our departments, the, these are the mentors, Dr. Suma Ganesh, our chairperson of the Pediatric Center of Excellence, she has always uh, been supportive and um, uh, very, very highly supportive and uh, gives us the uh, all the opportunities to do all this. In fact, this webinar was her idea. Dr. Umang Mathur, who is the executive director of SCH, and Dr. Sum uh, Manisha Agarwal, who is the head of Department of Research, have been very supportive. And lastly, the support team, uh, Mr. Amit from the IT department. In fact, the entire IT department at SCH is uh, very supportive. Dr. Sovita and Dr. Vibha, who are uh, my partners in the pediatric ophthalmology department. So uh, thank you all for coming through this and uh, come attending this webinar. It is uh, such a special thing for me now, and uh, it could not have been possible because uh, without any of you. Thank you so much. Shelja, I could suggest one thing. Yes, sir. We have some regular meetings where we present our interesting cases. Yes, we sir. I would come up. I would come up. I, that, that's all in my mind. <laughs> in fact, Ria would agree. We just agree. We thought about it. We will find, found, form a group, and uh, definitely, if you are keen for it, nothing like it, sir. Thank you so much. I will get back to you on that. We'll be happy to. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. And before everyone logs out, can we all uh, smile for the camera and click a picture? Yeah, thank you. Dr. Sam, please come. Yeah. Okay. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everybody. Thank you, everybody. Bye.